Welcome to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Kani Training Tokyo Japan. My special guest today is an old friend of mine, Joe Letiri, who is the Manager Director for Customer Success with Melbourne. Joe, welcome. Thank you, Greg. Um, thanks for coming. Very excited to be part of this. Yeah. Joe, people may have heard the name Meltwater, and some may have not. Can you just encapsulate what the business is that Meltwater does? Yeah, definitely. Um, Meltwater is a, is a global company. Originally, we're actually from uh, Oslo, Norway, um, founded by um, a tech entrepreneur there named Jörn Liesigen. So he's still very heavily involved with our company now, 20 years later, but oversees the, the global board. Uh, but we're uh, the global leader in media intelligence and social media analytics. So we work with close to 30,000 companies globally. Uh, here in Japan, we've been in Japan now for close to 14 years. Uh, we have roughly 800 clients um, and about 50 employees here in our Tokyo office. Uh, and I oversee mostly the existing client base, so servicing the team that takes care of those relationships and tries to grow uh, the customers that we have here on the ground. Joe, why are you in Japan? Why are you running this company? Let's get some background. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I like to think that I have a little bit of an interesting story. So my path to Japan started when I was six, actually. Um, my parents wanted me to learn another language. And a six-year-old little Joe, they said, uh, would you like to learn Japanese or French? Um, and so I visited the different schools that we had. And my mom said, if I learned French, girls would like me. And I said, okay, dad, what do you got for me? And he goes, well, Japan has samurais, ninjas, karate, Godzilla. And I was like, I'm definitely learning Japanese. That sounds way better. Uh, so in elementary school, I, I did an immersion program. So from six until... Uh, tw Where were you doing this? Oh, this is back in the States. So I'm from Oregon over on the West Coast. So Oregon was very advanced. Yeah, it was... Um, I think at that stage, even seen as a little bit experimental, um, there was even concern that I wouldn't learn good enough English if I, I did this. So I think only brave parents really sent their kids to the, those programs. And I, I think as a result of that, I was surrounded by people that were maybe a little bit more ambitious, like their families wanted them to, to challenge and, and do bigger things. So that was how I got my sort of start towards interest in, in, in Japanese. Did you keep going with Japanese? I could have, but I... Um, I opted not to. Uh, the school was on the other side of town, so I, I went to a more local like middle school where I could just skateboard to class on my own. Um, and I, I tried to keep my Japanese on, uh, up and going. I, I came to Japan a few times um, just on my own. I came for the World Cup in 2002. Um, I did a few different uh, visits just to try not to forget Japanese. Uh, but I, I did forget a lot of it, to be honest. Um, in university, I took a minor and just did enough to get some kind of certification. Uh, but I really had the full intention of working in the U.S. actually after I graduated. And I didn't really expect to come to Japan. What were you choosing to study? I studied uh, business and, and finance. I was thinking, you know, banking seemed like probably the logical choice on the back of that. Uh, but I graduated in, in 2007 and right before, the, yeah, the, the Lehman shock. So I, I, and I also realized banking probably was not for me. Um, I was a bit more entrepreneurial, and even in university, um, I, I ran my own sort of mini business, a bit of that. I even took, um, I took a year off school to go set up sort of my own branch. Um, it was a, a chain that sold like kitchen goods, knives, the pots and pans, those kind of things, and um, very much focused on just young people kind of trying to give you a chance to run your own mini business. Uh, but I set up a, a branch that had about 100 people working for me at one point. How old were you at that time? 22. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely had an inflated sense of self. I, I thought I could conquer the world at 22, but uh, running a business is tough. Um, I managed to get out of it just barely in the black, about like $100 of like what I put in versus what I got out. I walked away with maybe $500, and I gave the business to, to one of the guys that I had brought up under me and said, okay, I need to finish my degree, and I should probably get a real job that pays a more stable income. Um, so I went back, finished uni, and, and then started looking, and that's kind of when I came across Meltwater. So you joined Meltwater in the States? I did, yeah. I, I was hired as an international management trainee, oh. um, but I, I started in, in sales. Um, I had to go to New York to interview, uh, got the job, uh, but they actually sent me to London to start. So I started my sales career in, in London. Um, and uh, as an American in London, I'd never been to, to England at all. I, I definitely was a, a very sort of raw American on the streets and, and they could tell. 
uh, and, and I did not do so well in, in sales over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every time I would quote, um, they would say, "Is that dollars or pounds?" And at that time, it was like two dollars to a pound. So like they they just took me for the ringer. Um, so I moved from London to Singapore, and I had a little bit more success in Southeast Asia with Meltwater um, selling there. And that was when we started to research Japan, uh, and we said, "Okay, this is a big potential market." I said I speak Japanese. Oh, okay. There was no one to vet or like doubt that opinion. So, um, you know, I, we started to try to approach Japanese clients from Singapore, and that was how we tested out the market. Did you actually launch it in Japan? I came, yeah, I came with three other people. Um, two of them that were in Singapore with me, um, and then we brought over one of the guys from Australia to to also help us. When was that in Japan? So that was 2008. So that's you know, what is that? 14 years now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Um, I thought maybe I would be here for a year or two, to be honest. Like, and then maybe work my way back to the U.S. and yeah. that's where I would plant, uh, uh, sort of settle down. But um, Japan was just such a great opportunity, uh, and there was so much to be done, uh, so much potential in this market that I just kept finding more and more ways to to stay useful. What were some of the things you found challenging setting up in Japan, especially when you started leading people here? Yeah, um, I mean, it started with trying to hire Japanese people. Even that was a question mark about where do we look and, you know, what is a typical, you know, applicant have in terms of experience? Uh, you know, as you said, in America, you know, everybody runs their own business and we do all kinds of things. Well, not the typical university graduate in Japan. They come in maybe a bit more fresh. And I think we had to figure out, are we going for mid-career experience hires? Are we trying to hire fresh graduates and develop them up? Um, what is the level of bilingualism we can expect? What was the decision? Well, the first two people we hired uh, in Japan was a Kiwi and a Taiwanese guy. So, <laughs> um, but we, I mean, we definitely realized we should probably hire some uh, Japanese people. But we we kept a quite high bar for English, um, and, and still do. Uh, we think that just as a global company, so much communication comes down the pipeline from headquarters, the product knowledge. And really, if someone wants to advance their career in our company, English is uh, is necessary. So uh, we we do at least in the beginning, we did the whole interview process in English. So only people who could get a job would have been educated overseas or maybe half Japanese. Uh, but we, we slowly over the years started to build up a team. And when you had layers of local hires, then they were able to sort of help us sort of read between and maybe hire people that were maybe not as proficient in English because they could, you know, help train them. Uh, but the first, I would say, two, three years was, was very, very international meltwater. What were the issues? We had to think of what is our, what is our USP for the Japanese job seeker? Mm -hmm. um, why would they want to join us? Who are we looking after? And our typical things of fast career progression and... Um, those kind of things. It was a much more of an entrepreneurial pitch, and, and we've definitely found a lot of apprehension from people that we wanted to hire ended up going somewhere else just because it was a, a better business card in their mind that they could get versus an unknown meltwater wasn't going to really help them in their career. So we, we struggled with that. We probably still do to some degree, uh, struggling to find that right mix of person that kind of fits with what we can offer. Um, and we experimented a lot. Sometimes we, we went the edge of really trying to convince people to join. Uh, but we found that that never really ended well. Because uh, if they didn't join on their own accord because they really saw the opportunity and wanted it, they didn't end up being successful with us. So mm -hmm. I think it was definitely just trying to just spend a lot of time speaking to, to candidates and trying to find that right fit for people that were excited about this company and this industry saw themselves here for the long term and I think we've we spend a lot of time interviewing and we don't hire a lot of people um, as a result of it though. Americans, Australians or whatever that be no problem but in Japan I've always found that as a bit of an issue as well. Yeah. yeah. And so what about in terms of uh, getting getting people uh, they, they've got English they've got that not a real thing but in terms of leading them what did you find with some of the challenges hiring is one 
and we, we know that's a problem. And were you mainly using recruiters, or how are you finding them? No, we, because um, recruiters in Japan are expensive. They are, we're so, in the wrong business, Joe, I can yeah. tell you that, right? Yeah, so we, we try to do it ourselves. Uh, we try to build networks with the universities, we would do job fairs. In the beginning, we did that. Um, now, still, we will try to use our networks and referrals to to place roles whenever possible. Right, yeah. um, appreciate that. So, okay, you're, you're, you know, you're getting into, okay, that's one mark of, of difficulty is hiring people. How about when they're inside the company? What did you find was challenging in terms of leading them? I mean, yeah, because if we are also taking in fresh graduates, they, they are what they are, they're very fresh. Um, and we, we hire and bring people in based off of potential, um, but figuring out how to, to really tap into that is a challenge. I think it's a challenge probably anywhere, um, but I think for Japan in particular, you know, really wanting to create a safe place where they could take risks mm -hmm. and, and understand that it was okay to fall short. Um, but as a team, try to challenge ourselves. And I, I think we spent a lot of time in the beginning figuring out the right training methodology in those early years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took a while, to be honest. We were not successful like super successful in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but af after a while, we kind of figured out how to, to bring people in in steps and, and really what it took to not just get them up and going in the beginning, but really have them develop longer term careers with us and, and take people who joined with us maybe at the entry level and, and turn them into managers mm -hmm. and then train them as managers as well. Mm -hmm. um, how long does it take for new hires to become proficient? And productive yeah I think for us um, we have seen it's different person to person obviously and I we, ha we do spend a lot of time to really try to understand each person where they're at um, and it is okay to go at different speeds mm -hmm. uh, but I think it it probably takes six months to a year for things to click in a sense mm -hmm. um, and usually there is some experience where the person kind of gets over that hurdle uh, particularly in sales, you know, there's mm -hmm. you're going out of your comfort zone a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but whether it's those early successes or a string of successes, um, being able to connect the dots between what our business does and why the customers buy it, at, at some point, uh, it clicks. In mm -hmm. the beginning, though, it, it's a lot of just they're trying and following with their manager and their manager is helping them. Uh, but we slowly kind of push them out of the nest and out of the comfort zone until they, it sort of clicks and they can kind of run on their own. Mm. So depending on the person, six months to a year, I would say, before they're really up and running. Was headquarters able to understand that Japan takes time? Yeah, I mean, um, so Meltwater by that time too, we, they'd launched all over the world in a, a short amount of time. They had branched into many different countries successfully. Uh, and Japan was the slowest to, to really get an uptick. Even by that standard, I think it was still decently quick in terms of maybe a year and a half or two years before we really started to, to move along. But um, the expectation was up here. Um, I think there was the one mindset we really tried to have is to not make excuses, to not say, because it's Japan, we just can't do that. Uh, we really tried to keep a solution minded approach, especially dealing internally to, okay, if we had this, this might help us move forward. We were trying to present ideas um, and, and not just complain or expect them to fix it for us. Mm -hmm. I think we always had the mindset of, in Japan, if we think something should be done, it probably should be done, and we're the people that have to do it. Mm -hmm. No one's going to fly over from Norway or San Francisco and, and do that partnership for us or fix our product in, in that way. We have to present the idea back. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we have to, if we believe in it, we should just do it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think when we shifted that mindset and just started doing things versus mm -hmm. waiting for someone to do it for us, I think that's when it, it clicked for us. Were you bringing people in from outside or promoting from within? Mostly promoting internally. Um, we have um, more recently brought in uh, some more senior people, but mm -hmm. e even there, there's still a... Uh, I think a, a very common culture of, of Meltwater, like no one is just going to be given something on a silver platter. Mm -hmm. so no matter what kind of experience you came from, you go out there and, and kind of earn your stripes with the team. And, and I think that's how I think you build a lot of trust and respect with the team anyway. So 
the people we brought in have been, you know, I think of the mindset of, I see the point of doing that. I believe in that as well. Uh, I'm very happy to do that because that's how I'll learn. Mm -hmm. And I think they've gelled with the team for that, but we're very open for anyone who's coming in with a sort of 10 plus years experience that, hey, you're gonna have to go back and just start again mm -hmm. because you have some great experience, but you just have not done this before. Mm -hmm. So the, the expectations have to be very clear in the interview for that mm -hmm. to work though. How did you handle the training of those people promoted into leadership positions? I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a great question. I would say, to be honest, I don't think we bridged it perfectly well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times it starts with individual success, but just because you're individually successful doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be a great leader. Um, and I think you even juggled a little bit of the stigma of, it's okay actually just to be really good at your job individually. Not everybody needs to aspire to be a leader because maybe that's not the, the best role. Uh, and I think more recently, I would say after the last three, four years, we've matured a bit as an organization I um, mean, even myself, you know, I've gone up and I've gone down and I've moved sideways um, just to kind of show that, you know, it's you can go where there's a bigger business need. And it's not always running a big team. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want to launch a new product or a new new division or a new initiative. Maybe we can take an experienced manager and move them over for that challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's it has to be a little bit tailored to each person anyway. Mm -hmm. So for management and leadership development, it does take time. And I think the, the one thing I, I really wanna make sure we're always doing is that we're there to support the managers. And no one is just saying, here's a team, go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is somebody that they can work with that can guide them in that journey. Mm -hmm. um, and starting them with a manageable size team as they go up that journey, not just saying here's 10 people, but let's mm -hmm. start with one or two mm -hmm. and, and see how that goes. And, mm -hmm. And the people that can take one or two can then try three or four and then five or six. And, and that's, I think, how it expands exactly. naturally. Yeah. What have you found works well to get high levels of engagement? Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, it was a lot of fresh graduates on fresh graduates. Now it's, it's probably, it's actually more people coming in with experience mm -hmm. than without. So there definitely is that culture piece. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talk a lot about culture as a company. We have very consistent core values that have, have been there from the very beginning. Um, but we also very open that culture can easily just be like words on a plaque or in a PowerPoint slide. It, it, you have to actually you know, live it and, and do it and reflect on it. And it changes. Every new person that comes in, you're right, it, it changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and so just constantly taking stock of the team culture. And even the business results, different things can affect the, the mood of a team. And so I think for us, it starts just with kind of understanding each person, where they're at and what their motivations are mm -hmm. and how those change. And then trying to tie it back to some kind of common goals that we have as a group. Mm -hmm. And really culture is that sort of underlying guiding principle. Um, and we, we ask each other to grade ourselves on how well we're doing in certain core culture tenants. How do you do that? Do you use 360s? It is a formal process, yeah. It's even just their own reviews as part of their own review, like how well do you think you're doing on these principles? Why, why not? Why has it gone up or why has it gone down? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you think you can do better? Or what, what's, why do you give yourself the top points? What do you think you're doing good in that aspect? Uh, but then also when I present, if I go back to when we do our quarterly summons as managers, I have to present to APAC this is what Japan's culture is like right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it goes up and down. Sometimes culture is really good. Things are humming. Everybody's on the same page. Other times I have to admit, like, actually, you know, we're, we're not doing so well right here. Mm -hmm. This is a, an area we need to focus on this next quarter. What have you found that gets a team to live the values, live the principles? I mean, it starts, I think, by finding people that initially resonate with those values. Mm -hmm. So it's not as much of a stretch like we're, we try to look at that, you know, from the very beginning and, and talk about it at the beginning. I would say that they're maybe interpreted differently. And mm -hmm. I think that's where asking people what they think it means mm -hmm. or how they feel that is. And, and sometimes we have to align on the definition mm -hmm. of even how that actually shows up in our day to day. Mm -hmm. um, fun is a good one. Fun is our first core value. Fun is your number one. Yeah. And, and fun yeah. can be... Uh, can be lots of things, right? You know, it can be karaoke with colleagues after work, mm -hmm. or it can be the, the thrill of a really great customer meeting. Mm -hmm. And so 
and, you know, if we have to go back as to like, what do we mean by fun? It's really enjoying the work itself because you're, you know, nine to six, you're working and this is the job. If the job itself isn't fun, it doesn't matter how great the karaoke is, you know, you're not going to really enjoy this job. So enjoying the personal development that comes with it, enjoying the, the thrill of doing a good job or trying to be the very best. I think that's the definition of fun that we aim for. And, and then we try to, to talk about more than because everybody likes the Nomikai or like the team events. Of course, that's fun in its own right. But the, the actual job should also be fun. Mm. Um, what are some communication pieces you've found that have been very effective? No, it definitely requires like purposeful action as a leader. And it, mm -hmm. it's very easy as a leader to just focus on results. Mm -hmm. um, and we really try to come back to think it, culture first. Mm -hmm. Culture first, then people development. And results is really just the yardstick of how well you're doing on those first two. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about my week and my time, you know, if everything I'm doing is just about driving business and results and everything I talk about in our team meetings is about results, 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 then we're getting off, we're getting off message. And so I have to plan the quarter strategically of like, what things am I going to do that will, are going to be focused on the culture and making sure culture is right. What would be some of those things? So I think it's a, it's a mixture of like, who, who do I want to catch up with? Who have I not spoken up with, you know, recently? Um, it's the management meetings as well. Those are my sort of sounding stick because they're maybe closer to the ground day to day with their teams. I need to make sure those are prioritized as part of what we're doing. And in those meetings, we're talking about people and culture. We're not talking about results. Um, then I think it's the, uh, the team message. What, what does the team really need to hear right now that is going to pull people back towards that culture? Do they need to be reminded of the culture values? Is there one or the other that I should talk about a little bit more? Um, and that could be in the, the Monday meetings, that could be in our you know, end of the week chats, it could be something separate that we do as a, as a workshop that we have to kind of brainstorm uh, and in making them part of, the, part of the process, not just me saying things, but getting their read on what would help, what would be good for the culture right now? What does the team need at this moment? Um, makes them, I think, part owners of the culture that we have. Are people working from home or are they doing it hybrid? Very much a hybrid. I think it's probably a third come to the office. So how has it impacted having this, you know, uh, communication piece for you? Because, you know, that yeah. remote makes it that much harder, doesn't it? And so how have you found you've had to adjust to that? Definitely have had to change my leadership style because uh, for me coming to the office and I could see everybody I might not chat to them But I can see in their body language and their facial expression Everything can, can kind of tell just the general mood of, of who they are and I I think naturally I was quite attentive to that with the team and just kind of having a read of where people were at like Do they seem focused or defocused? Are they do they seem like are they laughing and smiling? Or are they like look uh, distraught, uh, but with remote working, you don't have any of that. Um, and even a Zoom session, people can put on a good face for 10 minutes, but mm -hmm. I think you have to, I think I have to pay a little bit more close attention to the actual activity that everybody is doing. And I do have to just proactively touch base with people more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, I think that through that, what has survived is people that naturally enjoyed the work have survived this period quite well. People that were really just here for the, the frills of the fun uh, and maybe like the people, but maybe not necessarily the job, definitely became a lot tougher because when you're off on your own, you were just left with the job and the customers. Just left with the results. Right, so uh, I think it's, I've had, to, I've had to adjust, I've had to rely a lot more on my managers um, to chat with people. Um, I have to probably spend more time with structured catch-ups. How many managers do you have here? Um, we have a few different teams, which oh. also makes it a little bit more complicated, but it, it's probably out of 50 people, there are probably 10 people that are sort of right. manager. Do you have a daily get together? Even that, like uh, it was, we experimented a bit. Um, and ultimately I asked the team, like what, what is good and what's not? Um, but we found that yeah, to start the week, we, we've always done it, but something in the beginning of the week, just to like, 
wake ourselves up on a Monday is, is kind of necessary and set the direction for the week. Um, and something at the end of the week to come back and present each team, what have we done? Those we did even in person, and we just kept those by Zoom. Uh, but we've added in, what I really like is at the end of the day, uh, because at, at home it's easy to overwork. It just to give people really that permission to like, it's, you know, it's 5.30 now, let's stop working. Let's just come together. Uh, in the beginning, we had no agenda, and we just did chatted. Whoever wanted to be there could be there. Now we break it off into breakout groups with teams. We'll chat just to debrief. We'll usually have kind of a theme each day where we'll talk about what we've done. But at that end of the day touch point it has been something that I, I think has been quite useful for us. Mm. What has worked well to get people to come up with ideas to make the business become better? Yeah, it's um, it's something that is a always a challenge. I think in um, probably more in Japan, people are less likely to put their hand up with a new idea. Um, uh, luckily, I have tons of ideas. Um, so I, I'm kind of, I, I try to lead people towards ideas that I think like they've mentioned something. And then I, I kind of think about that for a while and then try to bring it back to maybe they can work with me to do it. So that the blame is maybe a little bit shared if it doesn't go right like I can take blame for that project, but um, I, I really try to, I, it's harder now. I don't think people have the same mindset that this is their company like I had when I first we first launched. So the, you have to really ask them like what they think would help. I think it comes through conversations. Um, and then they, people will give you hints that maybe something wasn't right. They probably hint the problem first before the solution, but if they can identify a problem, maybe I can help work with them to, to drive a solution together. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the leadership training for managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. It's one of the issues though, isn't it? That you are the source of the ideas, so it becomes one, one person. But actually, how do you get them involved to come up with ideas yeah i guess that's where so um I, I say this to a lot of people like like when they first join um i will say like i've been here for a long time so i might not feel like things are broken because i look back at when we first set up and i see how far we've come mm -hmm. but for you to this is your first day so you probably notice things that immediately could be better mm -hmm. that i haven't even thought of so mm -hmm. i encourage them to surface the things that they think could be better first. They might not know exactly how or like what the solution would be, but they can probably spot the problem faster than I would spot it. Mm. Um, but if they identify a problem, we could probably spar out potential solutions. And, and then they might find one that, that, that seems like it would be a good idea. Why don't we try that? But how do you, how do you encourage that? I mean, as you say, uh, they don't raise a hand necessarily. People are busy with their work. They're focused down on their work. Yeah. And you're asking them to sort of helicopter up and think about the total business or aspects of the business. So, uh, and you're pumping out ideas like, oh, let's leave it to uh, leave it to Joe. He'll come up with the ideas. But how do you actually? Do you have any formal way of getting them to think about ideas, or some way of encouraging them to come up with ideas? Yeah, sometimes I will present. Like we'll do a team session where I can present a problem. Um, and I, I, in my head, can probably think of multiple ways we could approach that challenge. 
but then let them workshop and come back and present ideas. So you generally found that in a big group, not much will get done. Individually, also not much will get done. But if you get a team of like four or five in a breakout room for an hour, they will come up with some ideas. And then if you have three teams doing that, they can present different ideas. They, they, they have all come up with different ways to solve the same problem. And then it's just more like, okay, what should we commit to? Which of these ideas seem similar? And I think that's how I found the best luck um, so far. And is this a, a, I'm going to use the word formulistic in the sense of, uh, you have a, a sort of cadence of doing that or is it just at random or how do you work? I would say I, I maybe use that style where everyone's there in the same room for the, the bigger problems. Potentially even something like headquarters said, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to do is just say, okay, guys, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. I just say, this is what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. How do you think like mm -hmm. we, and they can come up with the how together. Mm -hmm. um, the other way for individual uh, ideas and creativity, I will just ask them in, in a catch up or a one-on-one, -on -one, like, yeah, anything that you think would improve the, the team or that would help with this aspect. Mm -hmm. um, anything that you're struggling with at the moment and just ask them what they think could be better mm -hmm. uh, and asking people every time I catch up they kind of expect that I'll probably ask for feedback or I'll ask this and so they start to come to those meetings maybe with a few ideas waiting for me to ask mm -hmm. um, but giving them that space and that permission that hey tell me and, mm -hmm. and sometimes people are hesitant Mm -hmm. And I will often just tell them, I have to present to my boss mm -hmm. some problems with the office. If you don't tell me there's any problems, I'm just going to have to make up things. So I want to know what the real problems are so we can fix them. Um, help me fill out my slide here. Help me, like, what can we improve? There has to be something. You know, mm -hmm. We're not perfect. So it prod them enough till they will finally suggest some things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's... That's how I've I've done it. I think it's just ultimately about giving them the time and space to say it. They mm -hmm. have ideas, actually. Mm -hmm. They just aren't sure. Is it really okay to say this, like mm -hmm. to my boss? Mm -hmm. So letting them know, like I just re I really want to know, um, and and being genuine about it. I do want to know. So you mentioned before too about uh, mistakes and handling mistakes, and I think part of that uh, creativity uh, participation is around feeling confident I'm in a safe environment here where I can yeah. I can take on things and if I you know, if it doesn't work I'm not going to get fired necessarily I'm, I'm you know it's, it's the penalty is not execution you know first right. penalty execution type right. of thing so how do you how do you deal with the mistakes here because uh, in many Japanese environments the way they deal with the mistakes is by screaming at people and calling them idiots so, you know, you've got that sort of way of doing it. Right. And there's probably other ways of doing it, which might be a bit more effective. But, uh, you know, how do you deal with the mistakes here? Because everyone watches. When mistakes take place, there's no secret about it. It's obvious. Um, right. And then people are watching. How, okay, how does, how does the organisation, how does Joe handle that? Because mm -hmm. that's a hint for them on, on what they'll do. Because often I've found that uh, Japanese like ninja when it comes to hiding mistakes and the boss is usually the last one to find out right. and usually finds out the last possible moment when you can't do any damn thing to fix it, you know, which is very frustrating. So you've got to try and really encourage people to bring stuff up early so you can you can weigh in with money, power and authority to fix it. So what's your uh, way of handling mistakes as a leader here? Yeah, um, I think it helps to let the team also, like they're very aware that I'm not perfect. Uh, and I own that on day one of any new employee joining. I, I try to highlight the things that I'm probably good at and the things I'm also not good at, um, explain my career journey with its ups and downs in between, and, and try to give them you know, a little bit of security. Like, I have not had a perfect career. Uh, I have made a lot of mistakes, but yet I, I have been, I've had a long, successful career at the same time. And so hopefully through that, they're they're already starting to sense that I'm probably a person that they can be open with. Um, I think that the team would have a hard time imagining me yell or scream or get uh, mad at them. Uh, I think that whatever the issue is, um, and generally I approach it with a, a very solution-minded sense to whatever challenge we face. Uh, and I'm also 
very quick and open to be in the most difficult situations with them. Because usually mistakes are the stuff that is most scary is when they're out with customers. And if they don't know something or they make a mistake in front of the customer, that's probably the most embarrassing thing. And if it leads to the customer ultimately not renewing the service, is, is probably the, the biggest fear when I ask people what they're afraid of. Um, but to show them that, you know, sometimes customers don't renew, sometimes we can do everything and I can be there with you and they still don't renew. Um, but if we try it together, we'll have the best chance. And I, I, I talk about it a lot, exactly like you said, the sooner we know about it, the more options we have. Um, I use the, you know, the ostrich in the sand example. And I have to explain that analogy with the ostrich, like no one in Japan gets that that is a thing, no, but no. I have to put it up there. I have to explain it. I have to explain, and they get it imagery wise, why that is a, a silly strategy. But I, I use that analogy a lot and I have to explain it to Japanese people a lot because I, I think it is really uh, apt for what happens often in Japan is mm -hmm. try to avoid the problem and hope it doesn't, hope it goes away. It goes away. I hope it, no one finds out about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. I, I, I'm very aware of that's a tendency. And I also explain, like, I've, I've done that too. Um, I've tried to fix stuff on my own without telling APAC or headquarters, like, okay, I can fix this. I got this. And then, okay, I, I don't have it. Um, but by that point, you know, I've learned my lesson that, you know, if I ask the people that can help me sooner, th then I have a better chance of success. And I think that, you know, to the individuals, the longer they work with me, the more that they know that that's true. In the beginning, new people probably don't believe that that's fully okay, but their managers will also tell the stories of like, no, get Joe's help on this. He's the best person. Or uh, I think that the managers do a good job now of telling that same message down so that even new people come in, they, they feel the same. Uh, that's an same important thing because, you know, at your level, you may have that belief. Yeah. But if your managers have the... Uh, where's something I can throw at their head uh, right. approach, you know, and start scolding them yeah. uh, type of thing, then it breaks down, doesn't it? Because you've got a sort of philosophy at one level, but an execution at a different level, yeah. which is the opposite. Exactly. So how do you make sure that doesn't happen? I think, it, yeah, I think that bridge is critically important um, and difficult to build. I, if I think of the last seven, eight years with that kind of layer uh, alongside me, a lot of time goes into just trying to build open communication with that layer because there's also a tendency of like, I'm a new manager, I wanna do it myself as well. Mm -hmm. I wanna solve my team's problems. I don't want to get Joe's help. Yeah. I wanna prove I can do this. Yeah. Um, so Which is yeah. okay if they're doing it in the right way. Right, or it is. yeah, sometimes the hard part is like, maybe results don't surface the issue. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't notice that it's actually was wrong until it blows up a bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the managers, it just is time is the same. It, it, through time with them, they'll trust me and they will, they will encourage their team to come up to me for the bigger problems and they'll realize that's better so they don't have to deal with them either. Um, but it, with anything, it starts with trust, I think, uh, and just trying to build that trust with the team. And trust is one of those things where it can go up and it can go down. It's very difficult to build it up, but very easy to, to lose it. So we'll talk about that because I was going to ask you about trust is one of those right. key things. It's sort of the glue of the engagement. It's a glue of the creativity part. And we talk about these days, I mean, psychologically safe environments, which is a completely new word to describe, you know, what we've probably always had or, you know, aim to have. So how do you build trust? What's your, as a leader, what do you do to right. build trust? Um, not easy. I, I think I can say over the years I have learned that probably the best way to build trust is just to start by being very genuine yourself. Very difficult to build long-term trust if you yourself as a leader are putting on any kind of facade. Uh, so everything about who I am, what I stand for, my personal life, I just I come to work every day not trying to be somebody else but just trying to be myself. Um, I, I think with the team, I try to also see them for who they are. Um, remember from the interview process what we learned and, and pay attention to what might be going on outside of work in their own life as well. Um, and to start just really with, I guess, that human empathy of 
yes, we're working in the same company, but we have much bigger lives. And this is just a part of our life. Um, and to really understand the full person and trust them, you also have to un- kind of understand everything that goes into who they are. Mm. Um, so if I stay genuine to who I am, it's much easier for me to, to not waver. Uh, and then people kind of know what they're going to expect from Joe. Mm. The good and the bad of it, they know that's who Joe is. Mm. Um, Your consistency. Yeah. Yeah, I guess for Japanese particularly, uh, lack of predictability is something that they really worry about. They right. like to have things ordered. The comfort zone needs to be clearly defined. Um, responsibility as tiny as possible. Uh, predictability as much as possible because in that right. in that sort of ad hoc uh, world of having to suddenly switch gears and, and do things on the fly, I think, uh, generally speaking, Western society is pretty good at that. And I think Australia... Business culture is very good at that. It's one yeah. of the problems. We're actually too good at it. You know? <laughs> uh, but we are very good at, at if there's a, a problem of being able to you know, turn on a, a dime, so to speak, as you, using American terminology, and, uh, and and make the changes and, you know, firefighting and, right. you know, emergency, and that's sort of really good at it. But that's actually probably not something that Japan's very good at. They're more on that ordered... Right. Even keel type of thing. So, having uh, you know, having that predictability of the boss is very important, isn't it? In terms of uh, you talked a bit before about culture, and uh, I mean you you're now bringing in more and more um, external people. But how do you how do you keep the culture? How do you create the culture? How did you build a culture from day one? Because when you build it with three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten people, that's one thing. Right. But when you have 50 people, particularly mid-career hires, it's not that easy to keep the same culture or keep the culture or, I don't know, do you keep changing the culture? I don't know, how does it work here? I think it starts by talking about it. Um, I think as it gets bigger, right, we, ha- we have to kind of divide out the sort of ships, so to speak. So inside of the office as well, you have different teams. Uh, and with the management then, at least if there is a, a, a line culture inside of the management group where more or less they're fundamentally trying to approach things in the same way, at least the, the team teams in be- below can kind of look up and say, okay, well, our managers seem to be all, you know, hymning, like sp- singing from the same hymn sheet, as uh, they say, right? So we're all kind of on the same page. We're, we're pretty consistent at that level. It makes it easier to expand out culture below it. Um, but I think that we're lucky, you know, Meltwater has expanded globally. So we have a blueprint for different offices and different regions. Um, we if embedded very much in how we, uh, we try to run our business. It starts with the culture first and foremost. And top management all the, all the way through from the CEO down still echo that and talk a lot about that. So it makes it very easy for us to dedicate time towards checking in with the team and making sure that culture is okay. Do you have a Japanese version of the global culture? Do you have a sort of tribal version of it here for Japan or are you trying to keep pure with the global culture? I mean, I would imagine now, especially over the last two years with COVID, we don't intermingle with the offices as much. Right. There, There's a little bit more distinction country to country. Mm-hmm. Um, but... You know, we have, you know, multiple people here who've now been in the team 10 plus years. Uh, so the, there's enough sort of culture pillars, people that really understand like how, how we've had success in the past and then why these values are important that we're able to, I think, still keep a, a good consistency. And I would, I would venture if we sent any of our employees here off to, to New York or to London or to Sydney, they would probably still find it pretty easy to integrate mm-hmm. with the rest of the team. They would mm-hmm. find it very similar uh, vibe, feel, approach to, to how mm-hmm. teams are working in, in any country still, I think. Mm-hmm. And do you get that? I mean, one of the things I always find interesting is you go to uh, five-star hotels around the world and you get that you know greeting from the general manager and he's some Swiss dude, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, and... You don't get, you know, Mr. Suzuki on your car. Like the Japanese uh, who are in the hospitality industry here, do, and you've got a big population in this country, 
do not seem to populate those jobs around the world. It seems to be right. Europeans tend to do that particularly. So you're from wonder why is that? You know, why aren't there more Japanese GMs? And often they limit themselves. They prefer to be in Japan. But are there opportunities? Have you seen Japanese from within Meltwater Japan go off and start, you know, like you, you went to London, they sent you to Singapore, are they, you know, are they back in headquarters in Norway or San Francisco or wherever? Is that happening or Japan tends to be, now we like Japan? Yeah, that's a, it's a fair point. No, we have not done that as much as we probably wish we could have. Um, we've had a few people who've gone to Singapore, who, who've gone to China, who've We've even gone to the States from Japan, uh, but it's still a select few. And I think part of it is probably that in those countries, there's actually more established business for Meltwater. So the reality is there's probably more career opportunity here in Japan. Um, quicker advancement, it's a, it's a bigger potential market to still expand into versus Australia, we're relatively saturated there and we don't necessarily need transfers in. Um, but I, I think still the, the Japan team, there are people coming up that have aspirations to take their career overseas with Meltwater. Uh, and we do want to try to enable that. And as long as they speak English, that opens up a, a lot of doors mm -hmm. where they can work. Yeah, no, my exposure to your team as English civil is incredibly high. Yeah. Very impressive, actually. And so we think about uh, if you were going to be giving some advice to someone has been told by the organization, okay, you're going to Japan to run the organization there. Uh, whatever industry it is, doesn't matter. But, okay, you're coming from headquarters or from another branch or whatever. You're going to Japan, you're going to run things there. If you're going to give them some advice and pointers, some of the, the Joe insights right. here, what would, they, what would that advice be? What so should I, they be thinking about? I think they're... Um I think that one thing that you'll have to definitely think about is if you're coming from overseas to run a Japan team that's already there, um, is it's not enough to just say, guys, this is what we're going to do, and then go mm -hmm. back into your office, <laughs> because they will just keep doing what they've always done. Mm -hmm. um, Why you, is that? I mean, you think about it. If you're, in, if you're in the States and your boss says, okay, guys, do this, you do it. Right. Why don't the Japanese do it? What's the difference? I mean, they, it's not that they probably will. They may be able to do it just very slowly. or like, Exactly. Yeah, or yeah. zero enthusiasm. <laughs> Snail-like pace or something. You know? I think that because before, I think before there's action, I think there has to be some kind of foundation. You even think about it in a business sales meeting. You know, before a company really wants to talk about business, sometimes they just want to kind of under, understand what, who are you guys as a company. Um, and we still, that happens a lot in our sales meetings is there's initial feeling out phase of e each other before we really get into proper business talk. Um, although maybe not as much as it used to be, there still is that underlying thing of, I, we want to kind of know what, what is this person all about? And I think that if you're coming in from the outside, the first step would be to try to get to know the people. I would also try to reassure them that you are, you are here with them for as long as it takes to make this successful. Because there could also be the initial skepticism of someone coming in externally would be, are you going to really be here like as long as I'm going to be here? Like you're not. What is your motivation? What is like, yeah. where are you coming three from? Three to five years, right? Right. So I think there is, you have to, first to, to really get through to the team, you have to understand the team. Uh, and I think you have to understand who are the influencers inside that organization that will help move things through. But first you have to understand the, the organization itself and what is already there. Uh, unless you want to you know, completely burn it down and build up from scratch, you're going to have to understand what is already in place, how are things done, before you immediately suggest improvements. Because they're, they're doing things in a way that has been done that way probably for a while and they think is right. No matter what the team, even in, in our teams, when we change leadership, even in, at Meltwater, Certain teams have a way of doing it where it can be difficult to unseed old habits without fairly, first kind of grasping where they're coming from and why they're doing it. And then you can kind of suggest improvements on top of that. And I think it's that Dale Carnegie, yes and mm -hmm. principle, not, mm -hmm. not just telling them down, but say, okay, that's really good. And have you thought about this mm -hmm. type of approach tends to pull people forward mm -hmm. faster, I found in Japan, than just saying, guys do this. 
because then you'll find that you say guys do this and then you come back a week later and, and nothing has moved and yeah so the problem though is that there's usually uh, people are sent in with an agenda you know headquarters all right your plan's not performing you got to go out there and fix it so people are coming in with that i've got to fix it mentality so what's your advice for those people I would say, so I've had the chance to, to, even in Meltwater, take over different teams that were struggling and try to rebuild them. I, I think you have to think it's not going to be fixed overnight. Uh, and you have to, you almost have to be prepared to sort of go down before you go up. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it's not going to be a straight line up. Mm -hmm. uh, but to make change, it, you may have to sacrifice a little bit of the short term for a longer term vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and. I think that knowing that coming in, having that expectation that my first three months are probably not going to move much, mm. um, but I'm, I'm thinking about this a whole year out of the stages with which mm. I want to drive change. And mm. I found that even in, in Meltwater, when I've taken on a new project or new team, if I usually plant the seed, like my vision a year out, mm -hmm. I can work backwards quarter by quarter and get there faster than if I just tried to run, right. uh, run straight at the wall. Because right. I think in Japan, you, you find you'll just get shut down uh, too quickly or you'll burn out or you'll burn people out mm. um, and you'll actually go further backwards than you intended to. Mm. What other advice would you give someone coming in? Um, I think, uh, yeah, be humble and, and open. I, I think that actually some of the best ideas I've had have come from the people in the team. Mm -hmm. um, not be so set in stone that your way is 100% the right way. Um, I think if it's in Japan, definitely if the team is coming up with the idea, you'll go a lot further than mm -hmm. if it's just one person's idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so be humble to, to new ideas, hear them out, uh, really try to find that right fit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also something you said, I think good leaders from really any country have, I think there's, there is a commonality of leadership that still applies to Japan. Mm -hmm. Japanese people are, are just people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the same exact uh, mm -hmm. different things that you can do to get to know them and, and starting mm -hmm. with the very basic leadership principles of, of people mm -hmm. um, is always a good approach in, in my opinion mm -hmm. anything else? yeah I mean I, I think that uh, I think if you in Japan as well my only other advice would be really embrace Japanese culture mm -hmm. um, I think there's the people will pay very close attention to little things mm -hmm. of do you attempt to pick up the language? Do mm -hmm. you attempt to use chopsticks? Mm -hmm. Are you open to the experience of Japan mm -hmm. versus I'm just here with a job and a mission. Uh, and I, I could be any country in the world. I don't really care. I think people are, I think in Japan in particular, are very proud of the country and they mm -hmm. want to share it with mm -hmm. visitors. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've definitely had, you know, meltwater expats come in as well. And, and they're very eager to take them to their favorite restaurants, take them to their favorite places. And if you embrace that, mm -hmm. uh, you'll get a much warmer response in general that, okay, this person also likes our country. They're here with us. Um, and I think you'll get a, a lot more acceptance from the team that way. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, we've talked a fair bit about things in leadership for Japan. Is there anything I haven't asked you or we haven't talked about, which we should have? No, I think, um, I mean, it's been a, a, a very interesting conversation even for me to reflect back on some of these, these principles. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the only thing that I would add on top of this is really um, coming back to that part about trust and being mm -hmm. genuine to yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're coming to Japan and trying to set up a business here or running a, a team in Japan, um, even if you're a, a Japanese leader taking on a, a team here locally in Japan, that... That trust principle, I think, is quite universal, no matter what country or what mm -hmm. team you're trying to, to lead. Mm -hmm. um, if you really want to have long-term success, you know, being genuine and consistent about it mm -hmm. um, builds a lot more integrity, builds a lot more trust from any team that you're working with. And, you know, own your imperfections as part of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, be humble as part of leadership, I think, in, particularly in Japan, then the team will sort of rally around more to say, okay, let's support this as a group, we're all in imper imperfect, but if we work together, we actually form a better team. And I, I believe that that's a, a core tenant of leadership in, anywhere in the world, but um, especially in Japan, I think it, it goes a long way. Mm. If you had to come up with a definition of leadership, what would you come up with? 
Yeah, um, I think for leadership, for me, it's about um, really tying people together towards a, a common goal. Mm -hmm. So the building, taking a group of people in, in a direction. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, leadership oftentimes has to decide the direction, mm -hmm. but moving people forward towards a goal. So whether that's leading a sports team or leading a business, um, getting people to work together to achieve a goal is, is for me, a, a core part of leadership. Mm. All right. Well, Joey, thank you very much for today. Appreciate that. Thank you. And please join us again for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews.